Wow, let's, um, let's just come to God in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for, for technology and how good it is when it works, Lord, but uh, how, how troublesome it is when it doesn't. Lord, help us to get this working so that we can continue. Uh, and, and, you know, we don't need it necessarily, Father, but it just helps as an aid. And, and we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for so much that you've given us, Lord. When we look around the world and, you know, we can see how, how blessed we are in, in, uh, in this land, Lord, uh, you know, we, we do have our troubles. We, we do have uh, people here who, who struggle, Lord. But on the whole, when we look at uh, nations where, where there is real poverty and there is famine and there is war, um, Lord, we're blessed. And, and we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we can be found here this morning. Many things perhaps we could have been doing, Father, but we're, we're here in your house and we come to worship you. We've, we've come to, to tell you, Lord, that we love you. And, and just give you the praise and the honour that is due your name. We've come to meet our, our fellow brothers and sisters and, and share a time of fellowship. And Lord, we've, we've come to hear from you, the living God, as we, as we sing, as we read your word, as we listen to your word, Lord. We want to hear from you. We want to leave this place, Father, knowing that we've come and, and met with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So yeah, Lord, I do pray that you know, as, as we continue this service, Lord, that you will just, uh, just pour out your spirit upon us. Open our ears and the eyes of our heart, Lord, to hear what you have to say. I believe, Lord, to each one of us this morning, that you have something for each one of us. So, yeah, Father, just move in this place today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, how are we doing, Eddie? Not brilliantly. Okay. Just bear with me, because I'm not doing brilliant on my device either. My battery's running out. What a day. Must be something. Okay, last week, you may, if you were here, you may remember I spoke, um, and it was a little bit different. I, I looked at, uh, it was a bit of a history lesson in a way, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't worry, Eddie. I'd leave it, I'd do without it. Um, so, with what is going on in the Middle East at the moment, we, we sort of looked at a bit of the history and how we as believers should, should look at this situation, how we as believers should pray for the Middle East and what is happening at the moment. And, 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 and we looked at a bit of the history, but how, how do we as believers pray? We, we, we said that you know, we, we, we should pray for Israel because God has, has commanded us to do that. We should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But also I think we should pray for the Palestinian people who are, who are also suffering at this time. Um, yeah, many of them may go along with, with what happened because that's the, the culture they're in. But I think the Palestinian people have been used by these militant groups as pawns over the years. They're like pawns on a big chess set. And, and they seem to be the ones that the, the other Arab nations and the militants will, will use against Israel. So I, wanna, um, I was going to show a little video, but I'll, I'll, we're going to turn to Bibles. If you've got your Bible, it would be really good to, to follow through today. I want to turn to Ezekiel and chapter 37. Briefly mentioned this last week, and we'll cover it a little bit again today. So I did have a video and an animation of uh, Ezekiel 37. Perhaps I can share a link on, on the WhatsApp group when I get home. But Ezekiel 37, God has shown Ezekiel a vision. He's shown him a vision of a valley of dry bones. And uh, he says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, well, God, only you know. Only you know if these bones can live. And God commanded Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones that they would live. And, and he said there was a rattling sound and, and the bones started to come together. And then the, 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 they came together to form the body. Sinews and, and, and flesh started to appear on these bodies. But they were lifeless because there was no life in them. And he said to him, you know, can these bones live? And he again says, only you know, Lord. We said, well, pray, prophesy the breath into these, these bodies. And the, the breath of God came in and, and this, this vast army arose out of his vision. And in verse 11 of, of chapter 37, uh, we find out who these bones and who this great army represents. Because he says in verse 11, that said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost. 
and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, says the Lord, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know it, that I, the Lord, have spoken and performed it, says the Lord. Talking about opening graves, what he's talking about is he's opening up the condition that has held the Jewish people in the different nations of the world, and they've been scattered over periods of a long time and he's, he's opening them up and he's allowing them to come back into the land that he promised Abraham thousands of years before and, and just to make it clear what he is saying in, in, chap, in, in the same chapter verse 22 he says then he said to them thus says the Lord God surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations wherever they have gone and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land and I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all. For really, I guess, for the most of the, of the last 2,000 years, you know, since Christ was, was on the earth, many people have, have thought that it, a restored Israel was a literal impossibility. Okay, because it's only in 1948 that they came back as a nation. So for nearly 2,000 years, Christians just couldn't get their heads around what this prophecy is, not just this prophecy in the Bible, but many others, what it really meant. You know, it seemed like, if you like, pie in the sky. It could never happen, even though Scripture foretells it, even though there are, these events are foretold by God. Believers... You know, back in, in the early centuries or back in the um, 1500s, etc., 1800s, they could not foresee the Jews returning to their homeland and being restored as a nation. And so if you're a believer back then and you've got scriptures that, that you can read and, and you don't believe in what they're actually saying in a literal sense, what do you do? So... What they did over a period of time, and I'm, I'm talking, you know, right from sort of a couple of hundred years after Christ up until modern times, they, they began to spiritualize these scriptures. They began to allegorize them. And they say it can't possibly be a literal Israel because they're gone. It can't possibly be that. It has to be something else. You know, and, and what they come up with was that it's the church. That these verses reply uh, to us, the church, because the church has replaced Israel. That's what they're saying. It was a word I found hard to pronounce last week. Supersessionism. How's that? Been practicing that. But basically, it's, it's replacement theology. And, and it basically means that they believe that God has rejected Israel, that the church has replaced Israel in God's plans, in his promises and his purposes, and that the church inherits all the promises that were given to Israel. None of the curses, though, in fact. wonder why. They believe that the church is the new Israel, that Israel is no longer the people of God, that the suffering of the Jews throughout the years is God pouring out his judgment upon them because they killed the Messiah. So they're under God's curses. Their, their suffering is therefore self-inflicted. The people who call themselves Jews today are the enemies of the gospel and the church, and that Israel's national rejection is permanent. That is not what the Bible says. If you read the Bible and you take it for what it says, talk, take it literally, yes, the Jews rejected Christ, but he never rejected them. And if you'd like to turn to Romans 11, to the passage that, that I read, Paul talks about this. He talks about, in, first of all, in, in Romans 11, I would encourage you, if you have your Bibles, just to follow along and, and to look. You know, maybe I'll say some things this morning that perhaps not everybody agrees with, and, that, and that's fine. There are different opinions among Christians. And I would say, you know, don't believe what I'm saying because it's me that's saying it, or another week because it's Jonah who's saying it. Take what is said and go and study the Scriptures for yourselves. 
Now, this is what we have Bibles for. Don't just listen to what's said here. Take it home. Pray about it. Study for yourselves. But he said in, in verse 1, and if you've got... a, a some Bibles have uh, like headings in them. That they're not in the original text, but the New King James, which I use, has a heading. And it says, it's Israel's rejection, not total. And I think that's a bad heading, because it implies that God has rejected Israel. What it should say is Israel's rejection of God is not total. He says, this is Apostle Paul, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. Because I, Paul, am also... Uh, an Israelite, the seed of Abraham and the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. And as we read, he goes on to talk about that God has always had a remnant. I briefly mentioned this last week. But he, he alludes to Elijah, who thought that he was the only one left when, when, when Queen Jezebel was after him, trying to kill him. And he says, God says to Elijah, I've, I've reserved 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee. There's a remnant. There was a remnant then, and Paul says in verse 5, even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. God has always had a remnant of the true believers in him. Today, you might call them Messianic Jews, those Jews who do believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And they are in a, in a minority. Obviously, most of, of the Jews do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And so... Paul is saying that Israel's rejection of God is not total. There still remains a remnant. He also says in verse 11 that it's not final. He says, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Just let that sink in for a little bit. The gospel came first to the Jews they rejected it, and God has given it salvation to the Gentiles, to us, so that we may provoke the Jews to jealousy. Because God loves his people. He loves us, but he loves his people Israel. Paul goes on in verse 25 of, of Romans 11, I do, I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. You know, He wants them to know about it. Least you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel. So they, they are blind in the most part, not all of them. And he says, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Israel's rejection of God is not total and it's not final. It will finish when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. What does that mean? You know, God today and since the cross, his, his main focus has been the church. He's been preparing for himself a bride because there's coming a day he's going to come and take his bride home and we will, we will be in glory. We will participate in the marriage supper of the Lamb. But this will happen, he says, when the fullness of the Gentiles is complete. Christ will come for his church when that number that only he knows is complete. And he says, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, I'll tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. It's coming a day when Jesus is coming for his church. And if you read what Paul says about it, Paul is clearly expecting it can happen at any moment. You know, we shall not all sleep, he says. We shall all be changed. He writes about it again in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16. He says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And then he says, therefore comfort one another with these words. You know, they're not meant to frighten anyone. They're meant to encourage us and, and to comfort us that one day our life on this, this earth, which okay, it's not as bad as some, but it's not good, is it? This, this planet is full of sin and wickedness. One day 
we'll be made whole and we'll be in glory. And when that happens, when Christ comes for his church, God's focus is going to turn back on the nation of Israel. And if you read the book of Daniel and you read the book of Revelation, we can, we can know that this, this period of time that God is refocusing on the nation of Israel is a period of seven years. A period of time that we can read about. If you want to know what's going to happen, read the book of Revelation, chapter 6 to 18. God is pouring out his judgment on Israel and he's pouring out his judgment on the world. He wants them to return to him. He's trying to purify them. It's going to be terrible times. The Bible calls it the time of Jacob's trouble, not the time of the church's trouble. God is preparing the nation in this time for the kingdom that is to come. And at the end of this seven-year period of time, the Bible tells us that it's going to climax in, in what is known as the Battle of Armageddon. I'm sure we've all heard about that. We've heard the word Armageddon. It's always used on, on the news, isn't it, when, when big battles are going to take place. It's going to be like Armageddon. And we look around today at what's going on in, 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 in Israel and in, in Gaza. And, and if you look, Israel has a few friends, don't they? There are only a few nations that are, that are backing her and standing by her. The Bible tells us in, at the end time, she's going to be on her own. No nation is going to stand with her. If you'd like to turn to Zechariah in chapter 12, he's talking about the nations being gathered together against Israel. All the nations, not one ally among them. And he says that God says in, in the early parts of this chapter, he's going to make Jerusalem like a heavy stone for all the peoples who want to heave it away. You know, the nations are coming against Israel. They're coming against Jerusalem and, and they want to destroy them. But God says he's going to make it very hard for them. He says he's going to cut into pieces those who want to take um, Jerusalem away. He says the Lord is going to defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He's going to destroy these nations, but it's going to take a bit of time. It's going to be terrible times ahead. And this is what God is saying. But in contrast, Zechariah 12 verse 10, this is what he says for the people of Israel. I will pour on the house of David... And on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace, the spirit of supplication. And they will look on me, whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. At this time, when their suffering is so great, they are going to turn to the God of Israel and they are going to see Jesus, the one whom they pierced. And they're going to realise that for the last 2,000 odd years they've been wrong about Messiah. They're going to realise that for the last 2,000 years they have rejected their Messiah. And they're going to mourn. Verse, chapter 14 and, and, and verse 1 says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in the midst. I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, houses rifled. Women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Sounds a bit like what happened on October the 7th, doesn't it? But October the 7th is a mini version of what will take place in these times. Terrible times to come for the nation of Israel. As God pours out his judgment to refine them and, and to bring them back to him before the end. Terrible times, but we're told that the end is glorious. Revelation 19, verse 11. John, in his vision, he looks and he sees a rider on a white horse. He's clothed in white, he says. He's got white robes on, but they're dipped in blood. And the armies of heaven are following him on white, horners, white horses, and he's going to strike the nations. He's going to rule them with an iron rod. And he says that on his robe and on his thigh is written a name, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is Jesus coming for the second time to defeat the enemies of Israel that are gathered against them. 
Zechariah 14 verse 3 talks about this as well. He says, The Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. as He fights in the day of battle, and in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And Jesus is going to set up a kingdom. And there's a whole load more we could talk about about this and, and the prophecies in the Bible. But what's the point, you may say, of, of bringing all this up? What is the point of talking about all this stuff that could, that could be years away in the future? You know, friends, we live at a time when the nation of Israel, against all the odds, is back in the land that God gave them. The bones and the flesh have come together. But they haven't had the life breathed into them. They're, they haven't seen the spiritual restoration yet. And I don't know about you, do you struggle with the fact that they have the same Old Testament as we do? They have the same prophecies as we do. How can they not see that Jesus is the Messiah? How can they not see? Daniel, you read Daniel chapter 9, and, and Daniel prophesies more or less to the day when Messiah would be revealed. He also said that the Messiah would be killed. And that is something that the, the Jews could not get their heads around, but it's there in the Old Testament. And what about the, 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 the most probably well-known passage that we could show a Jewish person to show them that Jesus is the Messiah? Isaiah 53, verse 3 to 6, where it says, He is despised and rejected by men, man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's plain, isn't it? We can see it, can't we? As, as believers. But they can't. Because they've been blinded in part. So what did they do? What did the Jews do with this? They do what we did with the scriptures we don't fully agree with. They spiritualise it. It's not talking about Jesus. It's talking about the nation of Israel. Why don't the Jewish people... In, in the most part, believe that Jesus is the Messiah. There are several reasons, notwithstanding that for the past 2,000 years, what they perceive as Christians have persecuted them and butchered them without mercy. Listen to this, uh, this paper that I found. The writer says, What then shall we Christians do? do with this damned rejected race of Jews fill their synagogues no, first their synagogues should be set on fire and whatever does not burn up should be covered or spread over with dirt so that no one may ever be able to see a cinder or stone on it secondly their homes should likewise be broken down and destroyed for they perpetrate the same things there that they do in their synagogues for this reason they ought to be under one roof in a stable like gypsies in order that they may realize that they are not masters in our land as they boast, but miserable captives. Thirdly, they should be deprived of their prayer books and Talmuds in, in which such idolatry lies, cursing and blaspheming are taught. For for their rabbis must be forbidden under threat of death to teach any more. If this advice of mine does not suit you, then find a better one so that you and we may all be free of this insufferable devilish burden the Jews. Next to the devil, a Christian has no bitter and galling foe than the Jew. Sounds like Adolf Hitler, doesn't it? But it wasn't, it was another German, Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer. And Hitler got some inspiration from him. And six million Jews perished in the Holocaust. So-called, what the Jews would perceive as Christians. But I, I did have a slide that I took yesterday off a, of a Jewish website. Search the question, why do not the Jews accept Jesus as Messiah? What is the Messiah supposed to accomplish, the article says. The Bible says that he will A, build the third temple. B, 
he will gather all Jews back to the land of Israel. C, he will usher in an era of world peace and end all hatred, oppression, suffering and disease. As it says, nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall man learn war anymore. And D, he will spread the universal knowledge of God of Israel, which will unite humanity as one. And as it says, God will be king over all the world. On that day, God will be one and his name will be one. And it gives the scripture references for these prophecies. And the article finishes with, with, it says, the historical fact is that Jesus fulfilled none of these messianic promises. And as Christian believers will say, no, of course he hasn't yet. He's going to fulfill them when he comes again. The third temple. I'm not saying Jesus is going to build the third temple, but it speaks about there being a third temple there when he is back, in, um, when he does come back. Gather the Jews to the land. That's happening, isn't it? You know, all these things that I've just mentioned, Israel would, would be desperately looking for these things to happen and come to pass. The third one about being world peace and ushering in a, a period where there's no oppression and no, no disease and suffering. The world longs for that, don't they? And what about the last one where it's talking about having a king over them? Well, the global elites want that. They don't want God as king, though. They want someone else. In 2022, in a conference in Dubai, the, the World Economic Forum's executive chairman, Klaus Schwab, called for world leaders to unite and address global issues such as climate change, trade, economic disruption. And he emphasised that this one world government must form as soon as possible. Just think about that. Can you imagine what it would be? You, know, you can imagine, we know the situation today, and in the future it's not going to be any better, so it's probably going to be worse. Can you see how this could happen? Someone, a man... With, 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 with enough character and charisma and power to bring all these things together, to guarantee peace, to, to, to rebuild the temple, to rule the world. You can see, I think, I can see how it can happen. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow. But the Jews would follow him as their Messiah if he did all these things. The world would have peace. It would usher in this, this, this era of growth and prosperity such as the world has never seen before. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, but the world is ripe for this man to arise, isn't it? We can see it. And it's only going to become more accommodating for him in the future. Who is this man? The Bible gives him many names. The man of sin, the son of perdition, but we most commonly know him as the Antichrist. You know, when we look at what's going on, it's obvious to me that we are living in the end times. How long we've got left, I don't know. The Bible tells us not to set dates, doesn't it? Not to try to, to set, but he's told that we need to be ready. That's what Jesus expects us to do. He wants his people to be ready because he could return at any moment. To live our lives in the expectation that Christ is coming back. But to carry on serving him as if his return is in another hundred years time. I don't know where you stand with Christ this morning. We all have our, our own lives to account for. But if you've never given your life to Christ this morning, if you're not sure of your sins forgiven... May I suggest that, that like Israel, when they look upon their Messiah, there needs to be a mourning. There needs to be a, an outpouring of grief. Not because we've looked upon our Messiah, but because we realise the sin that we have in our hearts. The sin that needs to be dealt with. And as, as believers, those of us that know Christ, we know that was dealt with on the cross when Jesus shed his blood. So if you don't know Christ this morning, the most important thing you can ever do is to get to know Christ. To get to know his love for you, to get to know that he loved you so much that he, he hung on that cross. You know, and as we read at the start of this service, greater love has no man than this, and he lays down his life for his friends. But what about believers? What about those of us who do believe? I have spoke last week about how we should pray into these things, but how should we live our lives? 
No, we know it can, Jesus can come at any time. It, it talks about it coming like a thief in the night. But 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 4, Paul says, but you, talking to the, the church there, and it applies to us, you're not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. The Bible tells us that once we come into a relationship with Christ and we're saved, we are translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of the Son of his love. That's where we are positionally as born-again believers, you know. but we need to live like it. We need to live like it. We need to live pure and holy lives. In verse 9 of, that, of chapter 5 of Thessalonians, it says that God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort one another, just as you are also doing. You know, we're to live holy lives, we're to live pure lives, and we need to comfort each other, encourage each other. That's the whole point of coming together to church, isn't it? You know, we could all, we could all stay at home and worship God. We could stay at home and, and read the Bible and, and put a video on YouTube and watch it. God wants us to come together as, 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 as the, the church here in Stanway and other churches all across the world that we may encourage each other and edify each other. When Paul spoke about the coming of Christ, he said, I'll tell you a mystery. We will not all die. In, in, as in 1 Corinthians 15, in, in verse 58, at the end of that passage, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, we're, we're not just to sit around and wait for our redemption. We're not just to sit around and, and say, hey, Jesus could come today. I'm not going to bother to do anything. We're to be steadfast in our service and in our work for him. And talking about meeting together as a church, he says in Hebrews 10 and 25, do not forsake the assembling together, as is the manner of some. How do we as believers pray? We pray for the peace that we want to see in the world. We pray for, for the peace of Israel. We pray for the peace of the Palestinian people. How do we live? In the light that he could come at any moment, we live, we want to live pure and holy lives. You know, and yeah, we do sin, don't we? We do mess up. We do get it wrong. And that's, that's just part of living in this sin-filled world. But an encouragement for us not to sin would be the fact, do I want to see, do I want Jesus to see me doing something I shouldn't be doing when he comes again? We want to be pure and holy before him. We need to be steadfast in our work and our service for him. And we must not forsake the meeting together where we can encourage each other and build each other up. So I know some may not agree with entirely the order of the events that I've said. But the commands at the end should be applicable to all of us. Live pure and holy lives. Carry on our steadfast work and service. And don't forsake the meeting together of God's people. As some are in the manner of doing. He's coming again. We don't know when, but we know that he is. What do you want to what do you want Jesus to find you doing when he comes? Amen. Yeah, Father, you are a good, good father. Amen. You love us. You love the world. You gave your son for the world. That whosoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. You're not willing that any should perish, Lord. But you give a free gift to each one. Father, I pray that. In the time that we have left, and only you know that, that you will just help us, your church, Lord, to, to keep on steadfastly working for you. Steadfastly, Lord, preaching the gospel. Steadfastly witnessing to our friends and our neighbours. Steadfastly coming before you and having that time in, of prayer and that time of reading the word. Steadfastly coming together 
each Sunday, not neglecting to do so. For you know, Lord, these things are for our benefit and you want us to do them. So yeah, Father, we love you and we thank you and we worship you. We look forward to the day that you will call us home. But in the meantime, Lord, we will serve you and we will work for you and we will spread the gospel, the good news. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.